intro into our webinar platform, which is what we're actually using here today to host today's webinar. So in today's webinar, what I'm going to do is give you an intro by showing you how to schedule a webinar. Now uh, you have to do that from the website. So I'll show you how to sign in to do that. So I'll show you the scheduling side of things. After that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through those in webinar controls. So when you're hosting your webinar, you have access to, of course, audio, video, participants, panel, Q&A, polling. So I'm going to walk you across that toolbar that you would see when you're hosting your own webinars. If you're wondering what it's going to be like for your attendees, you're an attendee in a webinar right now. As an attendee, you're not on video, you're not on audio, you're just listening and viewing. So here, complete opposite of a Zoom meeting. So people always do ask, you know, what's the main difference between being in a meeting and being in a webinar? In a Zoom meeting, everyone can be on video, they can be on audio, they can also share their screen. Uh, and with meetings, you can have anywhere from 100 up to 1,000 participants, depending on the plan that you go with. With webinars, it is an add-on. You can have anywhere from 100 up to 50,000 viewing participants. So here it's different. You're not on video, you're not on audio, you're simply listening and viewing. The people that can be on video and audio are the people that you invite in is what we call a panelist. So when you schedule your webinar, you have a section in the scheduler where you can invite those certain people to come in as a presenter or maybe to just to help out you know, through the Q&A panel. Panelists can turn off their video, they can mute themselves out in case they just wanna sit in and help answer some questions. I got almost 7,000 people in here, folks. I am here by myself. There's already a bunch of questions. So I'm gonna apologize in advance. I'm not gonna be able to answer every single question that's jumping into that Q&A panel. But like I said, today we're gonna to give you an intro into the webinar platform. If you are looking to get some more training on meetings, on webinars, on conference rooms, on Zoom phone, anything that we have to offer here at Zoom, take a look in your chat panel. You're not gonna be able to chat back, but I just sent you the link to the live training webinars. Those are free, those are hosted by the training team. You could register for a live one or you can take a look at a recorded session. I'm not recording this webinar because I run this one and others multiple times throughout the week. They're repeated the same content, so unfortunately I can't record every single one. But if you look in that chat panel, click on that link, it'll open up in a separate browser. It's actually a link that's at the very bottom of our website underneath support. Go to the website, go to the bottom, you'll see live training. You'll see the list of the live training webinars, the recorded sessions, uh, and of course, the search option that's in there. But like I said, today we're gonna cover some of those basics, you know, when it comes to the actual Zoom webinar platform. Uh, but don't forget, for those of you that joined a little bit late, the main difference between meetings and webinars, in a meeting, everyone can see each other, hear each other, others can share their screen. Here in a webinar, the opposite, as an attendee, you're simply listening and viewing. Now here we're using the webinar platform because we need to be able to host a very large group. And these are public webinars. If you're looking to host, you know, host an event to invite the general public, you wanna make sure you look into webinars. In a Zoom meeting, yes, you can go down the list and you can turn off people's videos, you can mute people out. But keep in mind, the whole point of a Zoom meeting is to be able to see each other and hear each other. You know, So you wanna make sure that you're not posting meeting links or your passcodes on social media. You know, Don't share them publicly if you don't want the public to jump in. If you're looking to host a public event, do what we're doing here, look into the webinar side of things here. You're not on video, you're not on audio, you're simply listening and viewing, and we invite everyone to jump into these webinars. All right, but what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna sign into a demo account to show you where you wanna sign in to be able to schedule your webinars, take a look at some settings, and I'll show you some pages you can take advantage of to get some more info. I'm gonna cruise over here to my left here, close my blinds, because it looks like there's gonna be a little bit of light creeping in here. So I wanna make sure I have these blinds closed because I'm using the virtual background. And I wanna make sure that it doesn't mess that up. All right, that's a good thing about having a wireless headset. You can walk away here. All right, so if you are looking to get some more info, cruise over to our website. Zoom.us, you got solutions, so you got products, you got industries. So you'll see more info, for example, for video webinars. Take a look at Marketplace. All right, we have a bunch of integrations for both meetings and for webinars in there. Obviously, reach out to sales for pricing. Uh, they can definitely give you more info. Scroll down to the very bottom, the very footer of our website. I always like to point out the footer because it's always here. All right, right below about, we have our blog. Lots of great content on our blog and how people are using Zoom, everything across the board. So take a look at our blog. We got the download section of our website. Click on the word download. You'll see some links right below that. 
But when you go to the download section, you could download the latest version of our meeting client. You could download the mobile app, some of those meeting um, plugins to be able to schedule meetings from Outlook or Google Calendar, Chrome or Firefox. Here, before you actually click on download, you'll also see Zoom virtual background. So they, there's a bunch of pages there. You can take a look and download some free virtual backgrounds. Toward the right, you got our main support page. The main support page has a search option. It's got some quick one minute videos, some popular topics. Uh, and then of course that search option that's in there. I'm not gonna open up those pages, but just so I can stay at the footer here. But right below support, that's when you're gonna see live training. That's the link that I just sent you in the chat panel. I'll open this up here. So here we have the search option, which is my go-to spot. Make a list of what you wanna know more about, scheduling, inviting, doesn't matter if it's for meetings or webinars, just type it in and then click on those related articles. But here, if you wanna register for a live training webinar, these are the ones the training team hosts. We got three for meetings, two for webinars, our conference rooms, which we call our Zoom rooms, our Zoom phone. For those of you that are gonna be managing the Zoom accounts at admin training here, the desktop client and the mobile app, Zoom for government. This is one where people jump in and they just ask a bunch of questions. And they try to answer as many as possible. And then we got the recorded sessions. Like I said, I'm not recording this one, but you can definitely take a look at one of these recorded sessions by clicking on watch recorded sessions. Go to the footer. It's always at the very bottom. Blog, download section, obviously reach out to sales for pricing info. The main support page, obviously reach out to support if you're stuck on something. And then of course, the live training and recorded sessions. All right, so I'm gonna go back to the home page. I'm gonna sign into this demo account, show you how to schedule a webinar. But before I do that, I wanna point out a couple of things, especially for those of you here that are completely new to Zoom. So when you go to our website toward the top right, it says my account because I'm already signed into this account that I'm gonna show you here. Sign into your own. That'll take you to your profile where you can add your profile picture. And you can also take a look at your license type. If they rolled out Zoom to everyone in your organization and you're not sure what type of user you are, this will let you know. So on this account that I'm signed into, it can host meetings and they've added webinar on top of that. The meeting plan can host 300 participants the webinar plan up to 50,000. So this person can host meetings and webinars with that many people in there. Anytime you see these question mark icons, make sure you click on them. They always give you more info. And of course, folks, start a meeting, start a webinar, test out the features for yourself. For those of you here that have never hosted a Zoom meeting, unfortunately, we're not gonna cover our meeting platform. We're covering some of the basics today for when it comes to the webinar platform. But make sure you sign in, take a look at your profile, also make sure you take a look at your settings. The first thing that's in the settings section is security. So for those of you hosting meetings, make sure you have the waiting room feature enabled. So when someone joins, they get a message that pops up, please wait, the host will let you in soon. And then from there, it's up to you to let them in. Make sure you're using passcodes. This will automatically generate the passcode for me. So make sure you scroll down the list. I didn't require a webinar passcode here, but I can, uh, but just make sure you take a look at the security section that's in here. You want to make sure you're secure in your Zoom meetings. Don't share your meeting links and passcodes on social media. That is common sense, folks. That's rule number one. But let's go to the left here and let's go to the webinar section. So from here, when you sign into your Zoom account and you click on webinars or even meetings, you'll see your scheduled upcoming webinars. So from here, if I have them scheduled out, I can come in here. I can click on start if I obviously want to start it, or I can click into it. Click on the topic if I need to edit. Maybe I want to go back in there, add another panelist, or resend them their panelist invite, or maybe add a poll. So I can go back in there and make some changes. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to click on schedule a webinar. So you sign into your Zoom account, you click on schedule a webinar, it's going to bring up this form that you need to fill out. For those of you here that have scheduled a meeting directly from your Zoom account from the website, exactly where I'm at right now, kind of looks like you're scheduling a meeting, but in this case, it's a webinar. There's kind of two parts. This is the first part of the scheduler. So here you got your webinar topic, your description, of course, the date, the time, the duration. There's options for reoccurring webinars. If you have any questions on reoccurring webinars, go to the support page in that search option, type in reoccurring webinar. Registration can be required or not. All right, that's up to you. If you want to require registration, make sure you have this checked. Webinar passcode. I'm not using one here. A lot of people do. So here it automatically generates it for me. 
take a look at your own audio options. This is a public webinar. So even if, even though you have webinar, I don't know if you would have access to only computer audio, maybe phone, maybe you got both. Here, because I have both, I leave it on both. So if you were invited in as a panelist, when you join my webinar as a panelist, the window pops up asking you to join the audio through computer or phone. Here in this webinar, as an attendee, the audio streams through your computer speakers. But if you look at your email, it does give you the info to dial in. All right, like I said, we got almost 8,000 people in here, 133 questions. I apologize, folks. I'm here by myself. It's a little tough to present and answer questions at the same time. Uh, but don't forget, we've got all those resources on our website. All right, so take a look at your own audio options and then scroll down. We've got webinar options in here. Here we got the Q&A panel, which is unique to the webinar platform. We also have the chat panel, but I have it disabled. That way you're not sending questions in both. But here the Q&A panel, anyone who joins in as a panelist is going to be able to take a look at the Q&A panel while they're in the webinar. With the Q&A panel, you can type out your answer or let the person know you're going to answer it live and you can verbally answer it live. I'm going to walk you across those panels when I walk you through those in webinar controls. If you want to enable or disable the Q&A panel, make sure you do that here when you're scheduling your webinar. If I were to uncheck this and start the webinar, the Q&A panel is completely gone. All right, and I'm not going to be able to turn it back on. So you need to make that decision before we actually start your webinar. Uh, a while back, I had someone say, hey, you know, I hosted a webinar, you know, and there was a bunch of questions. I didn't have time to answer all of them. I'm like, well, that, that's, that's the way it is, you know. You know, you have a bunch of questions coming in. There's 148 in here. There's no way I'm going to be able to answer all those questions. But I never turn off the Q&A panel. You know, you can always download the Q&A from your Zoom account. If you want to follow up with those folks, there is an option to allow people to submit questions anonymously or not. I'm going to show you where those settings are at. But the Q&A panel, if you decide you want to enable or disable it, make sure you do it before you start your webinar. The practice session. When you start your webinar, this is going to allow you and your panelists to be in the webinar. The attendees, if they click on the link to join, they get a message that says the host has not started the webinar. So this is allowing you and your panelists to jump in, make sure everyone's ready to go until you're actually ready to actually let people in. I always recommend that you use the practice session, even if you're like me flying solo, all right? This allows me to start the webinar. No one's in just yet. I'm able to bring up my slides if I need to, if I need to make some changes, open up some pages, and then when I'm ready, I can let people in. You want to make sure that you're always using the practice session. Start your webinar early. All right. If you're going to be presenting with others, I've started the webinar half an hour early in the practice session. On the day of, hey, jump in early. If you're going to be a panelist in this webinar, we're going to be in the practice session. Once we're in and we're ready to go, we'll start letting people in. Here, I'm not going to go through everything here. Anytime you see these question mark icons, click on them. This will enable HD video for attendees or video for shared screen video. This will let you know it is not recommended if you have a bunch of people joining from the same location. It's going to eat up more bandwidth. All right. I do want to clarify alternative hosts. One person schedules the webinar on their account. So I'm scheduling today's webinar. I can invite anyone to come in as a panelist or as an attendee. They do not need to have a webinar license. I don't even need to have a Zoom account. I just need to invite them in here because I'm the one hosted on my account. But if I want to make someone an alternative host, they must be on a paid meeting plan within the same account. So for example, that would have to be someone here at Zoom. They don't need to have a webinar license, but they need to be on a paid meeting plan under the same account. An alternative host can start the webinar for you. All right. But keep in mind, they must have a paid meeting license within the same account. Language interpretation is included. This will basically allow you to invite certain people that you might have hired or that you know to come and interpret what you're saying to a different language. All right, they're basically invited in as an interpreter slash panelist. So they're going to be in there. For example, they're going to be able to jump in to the practice session when you start it, which you always want to make sure that you do. I'm going to walk you through what I do when we have interpreters. You know, I always like to kind of double check things before we start letting people in. So I'm going to basically tell you exactly what I do when I walk you through, you know, those enmity controls. But this is the first part of the scheduler. This is the basic information that you would fill out. All right, once you fill out this basic information and you click on schedule, the page is going to refresh. All right, and then once it refreshes, that's when you're going to be able to add, for example, your panelists, your polls, set up your registration. 
So now you have these different sections that you see here. If for some reason you need to go back to this area here, you can click on edit. But now we have these different sections here. All right, invite panelists. I can import a list of panelists if I already have their info, or I can simply click on edit, add their name, their email. And as soon as I save it, they get their panelist invite. It is a unique link that brings them in with audio, video, and screen sharing. So here in this section, it does allow you to simply invite those people that you're bringing in as panelists. When it comes to inviting people to register or view as an attendee like you are here, you need to use your own email to send out that invite. So here I have the option to copy the default invitation and I can literally paste this anywhere into my own email, into a calendar event, into MailChimp, Pargot, whatever I wanna do with that invite, I can paste it and send it out. Here's the registration link. So this is just the registration link. So I can copy this and embed it into my email templates or draft up my own email, then paste it in there. Right below that, we have source tracking. So you can create unique links for source tracking. So say, for example, all right, I'm going to create a unique link that we're going to push out on Facebook you know, or LinkedIn, and I would grab that link. For example, this was for Facebook. I sent it to the social media team, and they would be able to push that out. And then I would be able to see, all right, how many people registered using that link? How many people visited the page? I can actually download a separate report for that. So if you want to track that, you'll be able to do that. As I scroll down here, we have the registration section here. So this is where you would go to set up your registration if you're requiring it. If you don't require registration, then it's just a, a join link. But here, for example, registration is required for this webinar. We are automatically approving everyone. If you're automatically approving folks, uncheck send an email to the host when someone registers. I had, I think like, I think I had like 15,000 people register for this webinar that, that you're in right now. I don't need to know every time someone registers because we automatically approve everyone. If you manually approve people, that means you have to approve each person that registers and then they'll receive their join link. You can restrict the number of people that register. So this account can host 50,000, but I can set it to 1,000. Technically, if I'm manually approving people, I can have 50,000 people register and only approve five. Totally up to you. But that's the, this is the registration section that you have here first. And next to that, you actually have those questions. Get a lot of people that are using the webinar platform for training purposes or lead generation. You know, they need to you know, have people register. They need to see you know, all of that info. So here's where you can set up your questions. These are some industry standard fields that have been set up for you. But before you go and invite people to register, after you schedule your webinar, grab that registration link. Take a look at the form. Make sure every single field, the topic, the description, the date, the time, everything is ready to go before you go in and send it out for people to register. But here, for example, all right, I got these fields checked, and these are required fields. You can also set up custom questions. Good example, number of employees. The field that's in here, I have it unchecked, but I have it set up as a custom question. The reason why is because the numbers on the industry standard one, they don't match what we require. So I had to set it up as a custom question. Short answer, single answer, multiple answer, required field, radio button, or drop-down list. That way, once you have that report, you have all of that info. You could download your registration report at any time after your webinar is over, when you could download your attendance, your Q&A, your poll reports, your surveys. I'm gonna show you how to download your reports after I walk you through those in webinar controls. But this is your registration settings, where you would set up your registration form. Now, right below that is manage attendees. This is going to give me a running count of how many people have registered for the webinar. So say, for example, right, I got 2,000 people registered for this and we're trying to hit 5,000. All right, you know, it's, you know, the next day or something. All right, let's see if we can do another push on social. You know, let's push it again, you know. That way you can keep an eye on that to see how many people have registered. If you click on edit, you can cancel someone's registration. You can resend them their confirmation email. You can pre-register people by importing them as a CSV file, provided you obviously have their info. But this will give you the running count of how many people uh, you have you know, that registered. Also, people always ask, you know, hey, what if I you know, set up like webinar, I purchased say for example, webinar 5,000 or something, and I got like 4,000 plus people registering, you know, or you know, what if I need to upgrade my account to take it to like you know, webinar 10,000 or something? Reach out to the sales team, because I'll be honest, I don't know 
how long it would take for them to flip the switch to get that capacity to the next level. So make sure you ask those questions if you are going to be looking to host webinars. Reach out to the sales team, obviously, for price info, but then, you know, hey, let them know. If I need to upgrade my account, like, you know, a day before the actual webinar, or maybe an hour, I don't know, you know, those are the questions you can ask to figure out how long it takes for them to flip that switch to take it to the next level when it comes to capacity. I get that question every now and then, so that's a good way, you know, also to keep your eye on the registration, because if you do need to get to that next level, you know, you can always uh, reach out to your, to your rep for that. All right, what else do we got here? Let's scroll back up. You got email settings. When you register for a webinar, I can send you out a reminder email an hour, a day, up to a week. Same thing for the people that I've added as panelists. People always ask, um, you know, what are the best days to host webinars? It's a little bit different here because I host webinars every single day. Um, I usually recommend Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, probably the best days. Mondays, you know, people are trying to get their week going. Fridays, I don't know about you, but you're trying to finish up and get out. Even though I do host one on Monday and one on, on Friday. Friday, I do it in the morning. Mondays, I actually do it at, uh, in the afternoon. So, you know, really depends on what you're trying to do. But Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, probably the best days. All right, branding on your registration page. You can add your banner. You can add your logo. You can add speaker info. Uh, it's only up to three. Um, I don't know if that's going to change. I'm sure the request has been made for that. But when you require registration, you can add speaker info. Um, you got the header text and the button, the colors. Obviously, you can change those to you know match your colors. Post the attendee URL. So when someone clicks on the link to join, there's that page that pops up in the background. That can be your website. It could be you know, a landing page. It could be an upcoming event. Totally up to you. You can add your own URL in there. And right here, you can customize the message that pops up when you share it on Facebook or LinkedIn. It usually defaults to the first couple of lines uh, in your description. Um, take a look in here because sometimes it might grab something that just kind of doesn't make sense, you know, or just kind of, you know, doesn't really clarify what the webinar is about. So you can, you know, click on edit, you know, hey, in this webinar, we're going to cover, you know, X, Y, Z. So you can customize that. Let's go back to the top here. We got polls and surveys. So here for this webinar, I already have a poll set up. I can edit that poll, delete it, or add a new one. If I add a new one now in my webinar, I'm going to have multiple polls. Title it. This would let people vote anonymous, question, single, multiple choice, multiple questions, save it, and now I got multiple polls. You can create a poll on the fly. When you're in your webinar and you open up your poll panel, if you click on edit, it's going to open up a separate browser for you. It's going to take you back to your Zoom account, so don't freak out when you, when you see the page pop up. But once you're at your account, that's when you create or edit the poll you already have. And once you save it, it's going to be ready to go in your webinar. I always recommend try and set up your polls ahead of time. If you have any questions on polling, branding, emailing, registration, go to the support page. You can get it. You can get to it from the top right. There's a search option. Make a list of what you want to know more about. It doesn't matter if it's for meetings or webinars. Type it in. Click on the article. They all have screenshots and step-by-step -step instructions. All right, here. You can now create surveys. This is something we added a while back here. You can create your own surveys using Zoom, but you can still use a third party. Uh, always get that question that comes up. But here you can add your surveys, and you do have the option for using a third party. Obviously, create it like with SurveyMonkey or something, and then paste it in here. When you end your webinar or someone leaves and the poll pops up, hopefully they fill out your survey. Q&A. So with the Q&A panel that we have in here, I don't, I don't allow people to submit questions anonymous, all right? I'm going to tell you why. This is a public webinar. We invite everyone to jump in. And if I allow you to submit questions anonymous, I'm not going to be able to see your name, all right? The reason why I don't, I don't allow people to do that is because this is a public webinar. Every now and then, someone sends something inappropriate. You're not going to be able to see it, but, you know, I have to search for them to remove them. That's the only reason why I don't allow people to submit questions anonymous. But this allows you to, you know, set up your privileges for the Q&A panel. While you're scheduling your webinar, technically you can enable that setting on the fly. And then the more option. Here, for example, you can stream your webinars to social media. By default, you can only stream to one page, all right? But there's third parties you can use to stream to multiple platforms. 
I've never used Restream, but someone mentioned that. You know, that's an option. So there's, there's some third parties you can use out there. But these are the different sections that you have access to after you fill out the basic information like your topic, the date, the time, and duration. Once you save it, that's when you get to these different sections. You can come in here at any time. You know, so here, if I go back to webinars, all right, I want to go into this one and make, you know, somebody else a panelist. I can come in here, scroll down, or if I need to edit this section, click on edit. What I always recommend, and I mentioned this earlier, after you schedule your webinar, grab that registration link. And then from there, take a look at the registration form. All right. If others need to sign off. So say, for example, all right, you got some other people that are going to be involved. They need to sign off on the topic, on the description, the date, the time, the fields. Grab that registration link, send it to those group of people that need to sign off. That way, once they sign off, you can send out the invite for people to register. All right, here's the link. There's the topic, the description, the date, the time, the fields. Does everything look good? If it does, perfect. If it doesn't, go back into your webinar and make those changes. All right. But that's real quick, scheduling a webinar. Don't forget, you have to sign into your Zoom account from the website, which you can do that from anywhere. Click on webinars, click on schedule a webinar. It brings up that first basic info. And after you click on schedule, it's got those different sections. Let me walk you through your in-webinar controls. So before I do that, I'm going to send you the link one more time because we've got some more people that jumped in a little bit late. I'm going to send you the link to the live training webinars, which also includes the recorded sessions. And you're also going to have that search option that's in there. The search option is always my go-to spot. Let me open up the chat panel here. Paste that. Um, don't forget, that's always at the very footer of our website, right below support. All right. So you schedule your webinar. You have your panelists added. They get their panelists invite right away. Um, you send out the invite for people to register. On the day of, you know, you sign into your Zoom account from the website. Go to the webinar section, start it. When you start your webinar, this is what pops up on my screen. All right, you're in a practice session because I have the feature enabled. Attendees cannot join until you start it. All right, so this is your time to get everyone ready. One thing before I move on, you can schedule and have as many other webinars before the live one. So people always ask, hey, can I schedule another webinar? with the people I'm going to be presenting and working with on the actual live webinar. Um, that way we can go over logistics, you know, anything. Yes, you can have as many other webinars before the live one. I always recommend what we call a dry run. If you're going to be presenting with others, schedule a quick 15, 30 minute webinar with them. That way you can see them, you can hear them. You know, are we going to, are we going to be launching polls? Um, you know, is each person going to be sharing their own slides? Get all that stuff out of the way. You can have as many as you want. That way, day of, you're ready to go, all right? But when you join here as a panelist, all right, I got my options for audio, computer, or phone. I've been here for almost six years. I've always used computer audio with a headset. So phone or computer. Don't forget, as an attendee here in this webinar, the audio streams through your computer speakers. If you look at your invite, it does give you the info to dial in because we give you that option. On the bottom left, you got your audio, you got your video. If you look at the toolbar, folks, there is no drastic change. For those of you that have been hosting Zoom meetings, it's pretty much almost the same thing. But in a webinar, it's only the panelists that can be on video and audio. All right, so from here, audio, you got video. Obviously, you can mute and unmute, enable or disable your video, or get to your audio and your video settings. I'm using a wireless headset. I have a little docking station to charge it. Uh, I forget what weekend it was. It was a three-day weekend. It, I didn't put it back on there correctly. So come Monday, I start my webinar. Beep, beep, beep. My headset starts beeping because the battery was basically dying out. So the camera that I'm using actually has a built-in mic. So I switched it to that mic. Didn't sound that great because of the room that I'm in, but I was able to you know, get through it. So you can switch it up on the fly if you need to. So you got audio, you got video. I'm gonna jump over to the language interpretation because this is something you wanna set up before you actually start letting people in. Those people that you invite as interpreters, they're in there with you pretty much as a panelist, video and audio, all right? So what I do, 
This is exactly what I do. I'm going to tell you exactly what I do when I host the webinar with interpreters. I start the webinar early, obviously. It gives me plenty of time to make sure my panelists are in and my interpreters are in. Once I have all my interpreters in, I get their attention. Hey, let me get your attention. I'm going to start the interpretation feature. When I click on start, what happens is they have to click on a button to accept it. And that moves into a separate audio track so that when people join, they can listen to the language that they want to listen to. So I click, I tell them, all right, I'm going to start it. I click on start. They're on video. I make sure they're on video. I tell them, give me the thumbs up. Let me know that you're able to see that little prompt, the notification. If everyone gives you the thumbs up, perfect. If one person, for whatever reason, doesn't get that little notification, there's an option to add an interpreter on the fly. That's going to let you basically add anyone who's in as a panelist, as an interpreter, who's, anyone who's already in there. So when you click on that, it's going to bring up this field here. So I'll start typing the person's name. I already see their name in the, you know, as, a, as a panelist. It's going to auto-populate their name. All right, I got their name in there. All right, I'm speaking English. They're going to you know, switch. Uh, they're going to interpret to a different language. So I pick out the language. From there, there's an option to update it. It's going to basically add them. All right. They give you the thumbs up. Perfect. All right. My interpreters are set up. Now, after I set them up, instead of start, I click on stop. All right. All right. That's good. That's ready to go. It's usually because I still have time before I start letting people in. All right. One more time with my panelists. All right, panelists, are we ready to go? For those of you here that are going to be helping with the Q&A, turn off your video. Make sure you stay muted. Panelists, I always tell them, assume you're on video. You know, obviously, if you want to mute your audio and turn off your camera, you can do that because I give them the privilege to do that. You know, cell phones, make sure you put those on silent. Make a little checklist of, of what you know you want to go over before you start letting people in. Turn off your phones, all right? Um, you know, make sure if the person that is joining as a panelist, if they're using Wi-Fi, tell them to disconnect any other devices that they don't need to be connected to the Wi-Fi because it's eating up more bandwidth on their end. I hosted one webinar. We had a dry run. Person sounded great. Using Wi-Fi, I was right, perfect. Day of? Lag, a little bit of a lag, you know? You're still at the mercy of the internet. So I just, I sent him a chat message. Hey, like, so there's a little bit of lag. Do you have any devices connected to the Wi-Fi? My, he's on my phone and my tablet. Do you need them? No, disconnect them. They're right up. All right, so that's just a little, little, little heads up on that. Um, all right, so, you know, you have your panelists ready to go. You have your interpreters, all right? Right before you start letting people in, this is what I do with the interp interpreters. One more time, interpreters, let me get your attention. I'm going to click on start. Give me the thumbs up. Perfect. All right, now we're ready to go. Turn off your videos because they don't need to be on video. Panelists, are we ready to go? All right, perfect. Once you are ready to start letting the general public in, you click on start webinar. And that's when people are able to jump in. That's when people can see you on video. If you're on video, that's when they can see something that you're sharing. So when you join this webinar, I had my PowerPoint slide up, the first slide of this, of this, uh, the first slide on this deck, just, you know, Zoom webinars. I basically have a slide up. I jump on video. Hey, welcome everyone. We're going to get started here in one more minute. Um, if you're going to be hosting webinars, I usually recommend to let people know, hey, you're in a webinar, you're not on video, you're not on audio. But if you have questions, you know, send those in through the Q&A panel. Um, if you're recording the webinar and you're going to be sending out an email, the link to the recording, um, you know, let them know, hey, we're recording the webinar. So if you need to drop off, you know, no worries. We're going to send you a follow-up email. Um, you know, anything that you want to let them know before you actually kind of, you know, really, really get started. Now, in your participants panel, you're going to have two tabs, all right? You got your panelists and you have your attendees. Your panelists, they can be on video, they can be on audio, they can share their screen unless you decide to disable some of those privileges. So, you know, here, panelists and attendees. I'm going to show you the panelists in a moment, but attendees, allow to talk. I can allow an attendee here to talk and then everyone can hear that person. They can't see him, but they can hear him. If I click on more, I can send them a direct chat message. I can promote them to a panelist, rem rename or remove them. When you promote an attendee to a panelist, now they're on video, now they're on audio, but you can move them from a panelist to an attendee. And there is a search option. You just don't see it here because you have to have more than one person there. So if you need to find someone for whatever reason, you can do that from here. There'll be a search option. You'll see it. Panelists, I took two screenshots for the drop to menus. Next to their name, you can mute them or click on the more button and then bottom right, there's some other privileges here. 
But here, if I click on the more button, I can send them a chat message, turn off their video, spotlight their video. So even if I'm talking, they remain the active speaker. I can make them the host. Maybe I need to leave. I can make them a host. I can leave. The webinar goes on. You can make other panelists co-hosts. Panelists can be on video, audio, and they can share their screen. But if you make them a co-host, they can rename someone, remove someone, disable someone's video. They can also launch the polls. They can't create them, but they can launch them. It just gives them some extra privileges. I usually will make a couple of people, if I'm hosting a webinar with some of my coworkers, co-hosts, because in these public webinars, just in case, if they need to remove someone, you know, because they're a co-host, they can do that. I'm not trying to scare you, but, you know, just keep in mind, if you open up the door to the general public, you're going to get the general public. So just keep that in mind. Now, here I can change a role from a panelist to an attendee, rename them, assign them to type out the closed captioning. I forgot to mention this. As I'm talking, the, the audio is converting to text. This is a feature called live transcription. All right. If you sign into your Zoom account from the website <clears throat> and you go to your settings, you do have access to closed captioning. Everyone has access to that where you need to assign someone to type it out, do it yourself or use a third party. But if you see live transcription, that's what I'm using here. It's been in beta for a while. I don't know if it's been rolled out to every paid user, but if you see that, see that in there and you check it when you talk, if you turn that feature on, you turn it on when you start your meeting or webinar, it's going to convert your audio to text. I don't have all the details on languages and all that stuff because it's been in beta for a while and I don't think it's actually rolled out to everyone. If you're on a computer, you can turn it off, but if you're joining us on mobile, you're not going to be able to turn it off. But you do have the option to use closed captioning, assigning someone, do it yourself, or use a third party. All right, from here, I can allow or not allow the panelists to record, all right? I can't allow an attendee to record. They have to be a panelist. Allow to multi-pin. That means I'm letting this panelist pin certain panelists' videos because panelists are the ones on video. They can pin certain people's videos for their view. So I'm going to clarify spotlight and multi-pin because people get confused with that. As the host, I can spotlight someone's video. They have the active speaker, even if I'm talking. If I allow someone to multi-pin, I'm allowing them to pin certain people's video panels for their view only. From here, I can also put a panel on hold or remove them. I don't think I've ever used those options, but they're there. Toward the right, mute panelists on entry. If you know someone's going to join a little bit late as a panelist, you might want to check that. Uh, that way, there's no disruptions. I do allow my panelists to unmute themselves, rename themselves, and turn on their video. And then from here is where you can allow the attendees to raise their hand or view the number of people that are actually in the webinar. Not the list of names, but just the number of people that you actually have in the webinar itself. But don't forget, you got two tabs. You got one for your panelists and you have the tab for your attendees and that's in your participants panel. Next thing on the list is the chat panel. So here I have it turned off, all right? But if I click on the drop-down menu, I can send a message to just my panelists or to everyone in the webinar, like I did earlier, or a direct chat to a panelist in here. The menu toward the right is where I can save my chats. Documents Zoom is always the default path. And this is where you would go to set up your privileges for the chat panel. No one means no one. Panelists means, means uh, you can chat, but only the panelists can see them. And then all panelists and attendees, that means we can all see each other's chats. The chat would be basically just a continuous thread of chat messages, all right? Here I have it disabled because I'm by myself. I got 264 questions, all right? And I'm here by myself. If I were to have the chat panel open, you'd be sending questions in the Q&A and you'd be sending questions in the chat because you see it's open. Not any certain person in particular, but it never fails. If I do open up that chat panel, I got people sending questions in both. So just keep that in mind. If you're gonna have a very large group and you got the Q&A panel, if you open up the chat, I would say 99.9%, .9 they're going to also send questions through the chat panel. And that's just a continuous thread. Where the Q&A panel, you're able to manage a little bit different. You and your panelists can see the questions that are coming in. You can dismiss or delete a question. You can let the person know you're going to answer it live or type out your answer. In these webinars, people always ask, you know, how come I hear you answering questions, but I don't see the questions? I can see my own questions, but I don't see the questions you're answering. And that's because I don't share them here. It's up to you and your own webinars. 
So here with the Q&A panel, I can see the person's name and the question. And if I click on answer live, it will show the person's name and the question to the rest of the audience. Unless I gave you the option to submit anonymous, then it would just say anonymous in here for everyone. So I don't click on answer live, I'll verbally answer live. If I type out my answer, I always send it privately instead of publicly. If you don't check send private, name, question, your answer. Totally up to you in your own webinars, but here, I just like to keep it private, all right? If you type out an answer and you forget to mention something, don't worry, I've done it plenty of times. Click on the answer tab, find it, and you can add more to it. If you accidentally dismiss a question, you can reopen it. Go to the dismiss tab, but if you delete something, it's gone, all right? But the Q&A panel, is something that you and your panelists have access to. I wish I had others in here. I got 275 questions and I'm here by myself. So do you see your registration getting to a really high number? And you're like me, unfortunately flying solo. If you can find some coworkers to be able to jump in and maybe help out with the Q&A while you're presenting, definitely helps out. I apologize folks, here by myself, it's tough to present and answer questions at the same time. Now, next to the Dismiss tab, you'll see the little gear icon. This would allow you to enable and disable some of these privileges here. So, for example, allow, you know, anonymous questions. And don't forget, you can download all your Q&A, your polls, your surveys. I'm going to show you how to do that uh, after I walk you through these controls. Polling. All right, you click on poll. The poll panel pops up. Allow panelists to vote. That's up to you and launch the poll. If you need to create a poll on the fly, or maybe, you know what, I need to edit this. Click on edit, that's when it opens up that separate window for you and takes you to your Zoom account where you're able to make those changes or create a new poll. And then once you save it, it's ready to go. Try and set up your polls ahead of time. You launch the poll, shows you how much time has gone by, how many people have voted. Once you end it, you can see the results right away and you can share the results with everyone in the webinar. It's only gonna show percentages, all right? After your webinar is over, you can download the poll report and the poll report will show you who voted and how they voted unless you gave them the option to vote anonymous. When you set up your poll, there's a box that you can check if you wanna let them vote anonymous. When you have multiple polls, you will have a little drop down menu here to jump to those other polls. Screen sharing, for those of you that have shared in a meeting, it is exactly the same, but you have to be a panelist. What I always recommend, meetings or webinars, have your applications, your documents running and ready to go. So when you and the person who's a panelist needs to share their screen, you know, when it's their turn, they click on share screen, the window pops up. It's gonna show those applications that they have running. Say for example, all right, I didn't have the PowerPoint running and I wanted to share it. I wouldn't be able to see it in here because I don't have it open. Make sure you have it running and ready to go. So if you only want to share PowerPoint, you click on it and you click on share. You do have the option to go to your desktop screen. I'm on a PC, so it says screen. It'll say desktop on a Mac. So from there, you're going to be able to share the view of your entire desktop. So now you're able to see everything. Close out any windows, any applications you don't want people to see if you're going to be working from your desktop. Now, because I'm at my desktop, I can open up whatever I want. As long as you have access to it from your computer network or browser, you can share that. Here, if I click on share just PowerPoint, you're not gonna see the rest of my desktop. If I click on share screen, meaning my desktop, now you are. Obviously, you wanna make sure you push those things to the full view, slideshow view, so that takes up the whole screen there. So share one application or share your desktop. If you're gonna be sharing videos from your computer, from the web, something embedded in a presentation. Make sure you check share sound, optimize for video clip. That way when you share the video from your desktop or the application that's playing it back, the audio comes through. This also applies to meetings. If you don't check, for example, share sound, the audio is not gonna come through. So you wanna make sure that you check those boxes and that way when you share it, that audio comes through. The whiteboard is gonna allow you and just your panelists to be able to draw and annotate. In a meeting, your attendees can annotate with you, but here in a webinar, it's only the panelists. This is something you can test out on your own. The whiteboard's available to free and paid users, but in a webinar, only your panelists. 
All right, the advanced tab, there's some other options in here. Um, portion of screen is something I can demo. Uh, it literally will let you share a certain portion of your screen. So it gives you a window that you can resize with your mouse. You can drag it around. It just shares that portion. Pretty straightforward on that. Uh, what else here? Computer audio. So this is a little bit different with audio. This is going to allow you to share the audio that's playing on your computer without having to share your desktop or the application that's playing it back. Uh, one thing I do want to mention, anytime you play a video or even audio, anything that basically has audio, you want to make sure you adjust the volume on the media player that's playing it back. I'm sure everyone here has watched a video on YouTube or you know, listened to music on their computer. The media player that's playing it back has a volume bar that you can adjust. That's the volume you adjust because that's the volume that gets pushed out to the attendees. Don't forget, you can start a meeting or a webinar at any time and test out any content you're going to be sharing in your own meetings or in your own webinars. They've added video here. If you already have the video running and ready to go, obviously from the basic tab, you can share it. But now this, they've added here visually, it's easier for people to figure out, you know, how do I share a video? This would allow you to browse your computer to be able to share it. You know, so you basically find it and then you can share it. Like I said, I always recommend have the stuff running and ready to go. Content from a second camera is going to allow me to screen share the view from another camera. So I have a camera facing to the left. I got one facing me, two simple USB cameras. But as soon as I click on that option, it stops my presentation to be able to give you the view from that second camera. Cool feature. It's available in meetings and it's available in webinars. Files. These are shortcuts to get your Dropbox, your Google Drive. Um, I'm always the paranoid one. I like to have my presentations on my actual computer just in case for whatever reason I can't get into the drive or something. So, you know, I'm always hosting webinars and they're repeated of the same content. So I always like to have them on my actual computer. Of course, I still have them saved to like our Google Drive just in case, you know, I'm out about them for whatever reason, you know, I, I need to get to it. But these are shortcuts to do that. All right, recording. Here, if I click on record, or if you click on it and you see computer or cloud, you can't do both. You got to choose one. Cloud means your Zoom account. In your Zoom account, you have a recording section. That's where your cloud recordings are at. You can get to them from any computer. With your cloud recordings, you can download them from your Zoom account to your computer. You can play them back from your Zoom account. You can share them. You can delete them. If I were to click on computer, it's going to record to my computer. If you are recording to your computer, you need to upload those recordings somewhere so that you can share them with others. Dropbox, Google Drive, or YouTube. All right? Little thing here. I have access to cloud recording, obviously. If I was recording, for example, say to my computer, if I decided, you know what, I'm going to record this webinar, but I'm going to record it to my computer. I wouldn't be able to grab that recording that's on my computer and upload it back to my Zoom account so that I can share it from there. Something you can't do. I'd have to host like Dropbox or Google Drive. So just kind of keep that in mind. All right. Live transcription. I mentioned um, some of you might see that in your settings. I don't know. I don't have all the details on that one, but that's what I'm using here. But you still have the option to use closed captioning. You can assign someone, a panelist, to type it out, choose to do it yourself. We've used a third party. I don't remember what we used. So when I start the webinar, I just grab the API token, copy the link. I already got the email for the, you know, the, the company we're using. Send it. They link up. They provide the closed caption. All right. The more option, that's going to be your streaming options. Don't forget, you can only choose one, but there's third parties you can use to stream to multiple platforms. All right. But that's the toolbar. In your webinars, it's only you and your panelists that can be on audio, that can be on video, you know, that have access to that toolbar, that can share their screen. Everyone else, I mean, you're an attendee right now, you are listening and viewing. So what I recommend, like I said, even when I cover meetings, start a meeting or start a webinar, go across that toolbar, invite someone into coming as a panelist for a webinar so you can see where those privileges are at, where those settings are at. You know, they can share their screen. You can share your screen so you can see what all of that looks like. But as an attendee, pretty simple. Obviously, you got some audio. You can uh, use the Q&A panel if I have it open. The chat panel, if I launch a poll, 
and it can provide feedback that way. Uh, the raise hand feature, you know, if I have that turned on, as the host, you do have the option to promote an attendee to a panelist or to allow someone to talk, and you can still move them back if you need to. But that's the in webinar controls. I'm going to walk you through downloading your reports, and then after that, time that we got here. No, we're going over the time they're scheduled. Um, I'll show you where the virtual background settings are at. But let's go ahead and go back to my desktop. So I need to go back into the account so that I can download the report. So don't forget, you have to sign into your Zoom account so that you can download the report. So let me give you this view here. So you sign in from the website. You got to go to the report section. This one's a little bit hidden. Yours probably be a little bit easier to get to. Reports, you click on a webinar. You can download your registration report at any time. So here we have these radio buttons. All right, registration. I can click on the webinar and download it as a CSV file. Open it up with Excel. It's on your computer. You can do whatever you want with it, all right? Attendee, performance, Q&A. Click on the question mark. It's going to break down the report info for you. You can only choose one webinar at a time and one report at a time here. Um, so just kind of keep that one in mind too. But this is where you would go to download all of that info. I do want to clarify attendee report a little bit here. The attendee report is going to show you who registered and attended, who registered and did not attend, the time they registered, the time they joined, the time they left, how much time they actually spent in your webinar. Someone asked earlier when we got started, hey, does the report show how long someone stayed in the webinar? It does. It'll actually show you the time they joined, the time they left, the duration. So, you know, all of that info and whatever fields that they filled out. Don't forget, once you have that report on your computer, you can upload it to any sort of database. You know, MailChimp, Pardot, Marketo, totally up to you. I mentioned we do have a bunch of integrations. Cruise over to the website. Let me bring this up here real quick. When you go to the website, solutions, you're going to see Marketplace. When you go to Marketplace, you can filter out by meetings or webinars. We have a bunch of integrations. I'm going to click on webinars. It's going to filter it out. Eventbrite, HubSpot, Zapier. There's a bunch. There's like nine pages bunch of integrations that you can use. So make sure you cruise over to the website for all those resources. Reach out to sales for pricing info. Don't forget, when you go to the foot of our website, right below support, you're going to see live training. I right, usually recommend, you know, taking advantage of all these free training webinars that the training team hosts. we got two for webinars, planning and hosting. And you can also take a look at a recording. I'm not recording this one, but you could take a look at some recordings from here. And that's always at the footer of our website. All right, there's tons of questions in here, folks. 328 questions, and I apologize. There's just no way I'm going to be able to answer every single question. Uh, like I said, it's a little tough when you're flying solo with thousands of people in a webinar, uh, you know, and you're trying to get through some content here. But I do want to thank everyone for joining. Please reach out, like I said, to sales for those pricing questions that came in. Uh, I can't answer those, and it depends on the capacity of the people you need to be able to join. Um, reach out to them for more info more training. we got a bunch of resources on the website. Um, there's still a lot going on, folks, so please make sure you stay safe. Make sure you stay connected. I'm going to take a quick look here at the Q&A because there's a couple of questions I do want to clarify. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to jump into the virtual background feature. Go to the support page search option, type in virtual background. It's going to give you the article on how to use the virtual background. The virtual background is something that everyone has access to. Meetings, webinars. It's something you access through your desktop client or your mobile app if it supports uh, you know, the virtual background feature. But thank you for joining. I'm going to clarify a couple of questions here. I apologize. Like I said, there's, there's just tons of questions and I'm here by myself, so uh, it's a little tough to do it on your own. All right. So here, a um, couple of questions I want to clarify. Someone asked, you know, do the panelists need to have a webinar license? They do not. One person schedules the webinar. So I'm hosting today's webinar. I have a webinar license. I invite every panelist to come in. They don't need to have a webinar license. They don't need to have a Zoom account. I can invite them as a panelist, or I can invite people to come in as viewing attendees. 
Now, one more thing. Does the co-host need to have a webinar license? No, don't forget. After you start your webinar, you can make any panelist a co-host, all right? Just got to do it after they start, after you start the webinar. Alternative hosts, all right? Clarify that one more time. When you schedule your webinar, when you, you're filling out that form and you have the option to invite an alternative host, an alternative host can start the webinar for you. But that person that you do add as an alternative host, they must have a paid meeting plan. They don't need to have a webinar license, but they need to have a paid meeting plan under the same account. So if I wanted to add someone as alternative host, that would have to be someone here at Zoom. All right. Is polling included with webinars? Yes, polling is included with webinars. Can you stream to more than one uh, platform? No. So don't forget. Well, by default, you can only stream to one page. But like I said, there's third parties that you can use to stream to multiple platforms. I've never used Restream, uh, but some people mentioned that one. Uh, someone said, can two different people record the webinar? So if you give someone the privilege, panelists, if you give them the privilege to record, they can record to their own computer. So yeah, you can give certain panelists the privilege to record and they can record directly to their computer. Uh, does the virtual background stay for all future webinars? So the virtual background, you can switch it up. It does default, that's a good question though, Robert. It does default to the last image that you used. So for example, I can switch this up to a different one. And if I were to start another meeting or webinar, you know, it's gonna default to the last one. So if I were to, you know, be demo like, hey, like this is the virtual background feature and I end this webinar. If I jump into a meeting or start a webinar or a meeting, it's gonna bring up this background. But you can get to those settings at any time. It's through your desktop client. Make sure you test it out because the image, start a meeting. You're gonna be able to see your cell phone video because you got lighting, clothing comes into play. I'm using a separate monitor. So if I had a different version of, for example, our logo, this one's gonna give off more light because of the monitor. So far, I'd have to say that this one here is probably the best one. But look up virtual background through the support page. It will give you the system requirements for both um, desktop and for mobile. Good example, I have an iPhone 7. You gotta have an iPhone 8 or higher <laughs> to be able to use it, but you can add a background. Uh, William, the headset that I'm using, this is a Sennheiser headset. Plenty of options out there, Sennheiser, Logitech, Plantronics. Um, yeah, I just like using a, a wireless headset, even though the training team recommends a wired one. But I'm here at home, and sometimes I got to let my dog out, so I'll turn off my video, and I can keep talking. I can let her out or, you know, just walk away and get some water or something, you know. So, yeah, take a look at the – I always recommend if you're going to be purchasing, like, cameras or stuff like that, take a look at the reviews. People are usually a little brutally honest sometimes, but, you know, lots of good, lots of good hardware out there. All right, let's scroll down here. Hold on one second. Um, where can I download some backgrounds? You can actually download some from our website. Um, if you go to the footer, I feel like everything's at the footer of our website, <laughs> or at least for me. That's why I always like to point it out. Scroll down to the very bottom, the very footer of our website, and you'll see. For some reason, it's only at the homepage. You'll see here, Zoom virtual backgrounds. So you can download some from there. Do a search, you know, free Zoom backgrounds. The virtual background here, real quick, I got to jump into another meeting, but here, it's something that you access through your desktop client. This is something that everyone has access to. A lot of people don't, don't understand, or not, don't, they don't know that when you set up a free account or even a paid account, you have access to our desktop client on your computer or the mobile app. So with this and the mobile app, you can schedule meetings, start meetings, join meetings, and some message, and you can get to your settings. So from the computer, because I'm at the home screen, I can click on that little gear icon. Or I can click on the icon above that and click on settings. So for example, this was created in-house. They sent it out. I downloaded it. All right. Now I come in here to background and filters. I click on the plus sign. I browse for it. I find it. I double click. It adds it to my background and my library. And I have some, uh, my last webinar that I got out of right before this one asked, you know, can I take some pictures on my phone and add them to my background? If you're using your mobile device, if you're hosting on your mobile device, you can use images from your phone. Or for example, I took this picture from my phone. I just sent it to myself, emailed it. And then from there, I was able to basically add as my background. 
but I have a bunch of different backgrounds, you know, quick little videos, but make sure you test it out. Like I said, um, real quick here, I am using a green screen. I don't have to use one now because with the latest updates, I no longer need to have a solid color background. They did add the blur feature, which is going to blur whatever's behind you. In my case, it's a green screen, but it's literally a piece of green material. Jump on Amazon. They got green screens, blue screens, lighting. But I'm going to show you here. One of the reasons why I'm still using the green screen. I'm going to uncheck. I have a green screen. I'm going to pick one of these images. I'm going to stop sharing. I have a bunch of windows around me, so the lighting's a little weird in here. That's why when I move my hands, you can still see the green screen behind me. If I took that down, you would be able to see a little bit of whatever's behind me. And it doesn't fill in these little gaps with my headset. If I check the settings one more time where it says I have a green screen, if I check that, it's going to fill in those gaps, as you see here. Test it out. You know, if you're in a decent room with some good lighting, you might not need to purchase a green screen, uh, but jump on Amazon. You can use a solid color wall, but test it out because the walls in here, for example, that I have are white. It's too light and I got too many windows, so it's not going to work. But you can always start a meeting at any time and, and test these things out for yourself. All right. Lots of questions in here, folks. Now we got 410. I apologize. Like I said, it's a little tough to present and answer questions on your own. But thank you for joining. Reach out to the sales folks for those pricing plans. Take advantage of the live training webinars, the recorded sessions, the search option through the support page. If you're stuck on something, you, you're having some sort of technical issues, reach out to our support team. You can do that from the support page. But thank you for joining. Uh, like I said, please make sure you stay safe uh, and make sure you stay connected. Thanks again, folks. Bye, everyone.